Welcome back to the Diabetic Podcast. I'm Justin. I have type 1 diabetes. And on here, I talk all things diabetes tech, news and management with tech leaders, educators, and those living with diabetes. Today is a super special episode to me because I am the interviewee. My diabetes educator, Mary Rose, she was there for me at early diagnosis and played such an integral role in learning and and getting the ropes of managing diabetes. So this time she's coming on the show to interview me about that early diagnosis, the learning curve of treating diabetes and getting into diabetes tech and educating people online. I was also super vulnerable when she asks me about what I miss in the before times. I was diagnosed just two years ago at 30 years old and I really didn't realize how much I was holding in until I verbalized it. So get ready for that. I don't know if I'm ready for you to see that. Anyway, keep in mind that anything you hear on this podcast or content on my social media and YouTube is not medical advice. Always consult with your physician before making changes to your healthcare. All right, let's get into the interview. Mary Rose, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Uh, and being the one interviewing, this is going to be a little different than most shows, but I'm excited to answer your questions and have this conversation. Yeah, and I've, it, you know, it's it's an honor and a privilege to be here. Thank you for inviting me. And, um, you know, I know that getting diagnosed with a chronic disease like type one diabetes can be life shattering. Um, however, I have watched you cope in such a superstar kind of way. And I'm really excited to interview you about this. I know your um, initial diagnosis happened on social media. And I thought that maybe quickly you could kind of tell us that story. Yeah, so I was posting videos on social media at the time. I was diagnosed with type two. And I was on metformin and my doctor had me testing my blood sugar and he eventually like put me on Lantus and I was posting these videos on TikTok like my blood sugar is 450 is that high or um, like this is Lantus this is how I do this and these videos kind of just like blew up everyone was commenting like you have type 1 you need to get an endo you need to get a CGM you need to get a pump and with that encouragement and guidance I did and a few months later um, I got I went to your practice And I got the C peptide test and I was, I tested positive for type one diabetes or type 1.5 LATA. And, um, since then I just have continued to post content and start a YouTube channel and this podcast, which we're now on together, which is amazing. (laughs) Yeah. You've done an amazing job. You know, they say that when you're newly diagnosed with a chronic illness, that you go through five phases of, of coping and ex- to get to acceptance. So acceptance is the, you know, the ultimate goal. Um, but people go through anger, denial, bargaining, depression, and then finally to acceptance. And then sometimes they vacillate from one stage to the other. What would you say uh, the stage is that you're in today? I think the stage I'm in now is thriving. <laughs> Um, Wonderful. I came up with like, <laughs> right. I, I changed I it. Say. I mean, yeah. I de- right. I mean, yeah. definitely, obviously, acceptance. But I think that like I I've taken this diagnosis and found the power in it accidentally, and mm. also I found the power of community and everyone who's listening right now. I've been able to harness this community that already existed and bring them together to watch my content and then comment with each other and help each other, which has been one of the most rewarding things. But yeah, I went through, you know, multiple phases, uh, especially when I first met you, which we'll get into, like, I was not okay when I met you. But I think at this point, two years in, I've gotten to a point where I feel very in control. With that said, I have moments that I'm not in control, uh, that are hard on me. But Overall, more often than not, I feel pretty um, in control of my diabetes and I just enjoy talking about it with people to help others out there. I think you're very unique in that way, Justin, and I love that you're a role model to others. But, you know, I've also seen people in my practice that take a lifetime 
to accept and master this disease, right? What do you think is different about you? I mean, did your parents model a, an active way of coping with problems? Do you think you have grit? They say people with grit have resilience and passion and, you know, vigilance and, 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 and that kind of stuff you were just talking about. What do you think it is about you? Maybe your technology experience that helped you to actually become a master of this disease so quickly over the past three years? Yeah, well, first of all, I'm very type A. So I like things mm. in an orderly place. I'm very regimented. I like a routine. I like to mm -hmm. wake up, have the exact same coffee, make my breakfast. Right. That's like one of that three helps. different breakfasts. Mm -hmm. Go to the gym, drink the exact same protein shake. Like I just, I feel very secure when I'm doing things that I know work. So I think it definitely helps like eating very similar things. I think when I struggle the most, it's like on vacation, visiting a friend and eating new foods. But I also think that I've just always had like very strong drive throughout my career. Yeah. I just always wanted to do the best I can and move the furthest I could, I guess, for success. And with my diabetes, I think because I was diagnosed so late in age at 30 years old, I had built all the coping mechanisms to... Mm do things to the best of my ability and and do them at, yeah do them as best as i can so mm -hmm. with that kind of with those mechanisms in place i was able to tackle it head on but i also wouldn't have been able to do that without the accessibility to healthcare with like meeting you and meeting with you very often and kind of study i mean it was studying like i was taking my own tests and experiments and hypotheses and try, uh, trying new things and seeing what works, what didn't work and adjusting settings. And I think that if you're doing this alone, you're doing it wrong in so yes. many ways when it comes to healthcare yes. providers, when it comes to just people to talk to and, and even people to complain to. Like talk to your, I talk to my friends that I'm with at dinner and I'll be like, my blood sugar's high. Like I'm very annoyed by this and they're like oh like why don't you go outside and do some squats like having a friend tell me to go do squats is like so cool because that's sometimes something that like makes you feel insecure about having to like go do a little workout to raise your insulin sensitivity but i think that i've built like a good network of friends and community on social media too yeah what was it like for you to go from sort of getting all that support from social media to like a big academic diabetes center where we specialize in type one and you have this educator that's seeing you every week and helping you fix things and adapt to technology and using those tools. Like how did that feel to have that kind of support finally um, from the medical community? It's funny because it felt very overwhelming. <laughs> uh, <laughs> social media felt very overwhelming when I was posting these videos and all these comments were coming. While it was so helpful, it was very overwhelming to hear all of these comments telling me what to do. But I listened to them and I, and I took it one step at a time. I think at diagnosis, it's so important to take it one step at a time. Yes. Not make like and and list list things out, but if you give yourself too much work to do, then you'll never start. So if you give yourself one thing, you do that. Two things, you'll do that. But when I came to you, I just remember our first appointment together, and you told me all these things about carb counting and insulin with food, and that was very scary to me. And it and it to me it sounded like how am I ever going to get this down? This is a lot. But you said a couple things. You said, it's going to be fine. I work with so many people. And you also said, like, it can take a year to get it down. And that's completely true. I, I really think that it took me one year to feel all, super confident in tackling my diabetes. Definitely still coming into contact with situations like that are very new to me, like going to a blackout dinner where you can't see your food. Uh, or yeah. going to dim sum where there's food carts coming around with Thai iced tea and all these different rice cakes. Like, I'm still experiencing these difficult situations, but then I grow stronger with each one.
Yes. I, you know, when thinking about, you know, preparing these questions for you about your diagnosis and how you moved through the different phases of acceptance, I thought about all the first things that you did, you know, like the first time you traveled with your friends to Mexico, you know, uh, with your smart pen, you know, Um, and I felt like every time you did something for the first time, you had a new freedom that you could live a normal life again. And it sort of took away some of that distress you were having. I mean, is that true? I mean, can you share with other people what that was like? Yeah, I think that over my two years, I kept hopping from new treatment to new treatment. So I started with Lantus Mm -hmm. and uh, short acting insulin pens. Then I moved on to the InPen, which is a smart insulin pen, which helps calculate what you should bolus based off of the uh, blood sugar you enter in. And then moving on to a pump. And at first I moved on to Omnipod without any closed loop. So that was a step up in like getting my basal insulin, but I still needed to figure out bolusing with like a PDM and then moving on to loop, a closed loop system and having that kind of self-regulate in so many ways. I mean, I feel like I've just become more and more free of the nuisance of diabetes. I mean, there's definitely still like obstacles and challenges with all of this technology, but it's allowed me to be in the more, more in the moment than I have been. And like back to that, like Mexico trip, I remember like telling you about that. Like I was really scared. I was really afraid to go on this trip. I knew I'd be drinking. I'd be on a beach. I'd be going swimming. I'd be running around. And these were just at this point, I had not been doing any of that. Like I was living in Palm Springs during COVID being super mellow. Um, I wasn't really drinking much. I wasn't, you know, being super duper active at that time either. And this was just, it was a big, it was a scary moment, but I wound up getting through it without any issues. And you helped give me that confidence. You just told me that I was strong enough and that it would be okay, even though I was really scared and, and it wound up being okay. Yeah. And I think you've done so many amazing things since then, but that was the first outing and, um, it, it got complicated. I mean, you guys got, didn't you all get COVID or something, but you coped so well with it. We had the (laughs) list of things to do. It was great. You were prepared and I had your back. So that was amazing. And, you know, I always think about like, uh, you know, when I, when I meet patients, I have to sort of assess for readiness um, to use these sort of wearables and, and tech stuff to help them cope with their diabetes and master their diabetes, right? And when I met you, you know, you weren't ready completely, but I would say on a scale of one to 10, you were maybe an eight. When most people come in at maybe a five, you know, do you think and a lot of times they come in at a one to five or a zero. Like I am never putting anything on my body. I date, I you know, wear bikinis, bloody bleep. But you were, uh, you know, you were more of an eight. Do you think that being a diabetes tech or just a tech expert in the beginning helped you to move along that continuum a little bit sooner and get on loop and get into advanced insulin management? Um, have you dealt with any of these these troubling things about dating and wearables and where to put them on with certain outfits. Um, Yeah. Let me start with the like technology and then we'll get into like dating in a second. So don't let me forget. I think like I definitely had an advantage with the technology and moving Mm -hmm. forward with it quickly because I love technology. I think it's so cool. I love to talk about it. I love to share it. And I love to educate others about it. I'd been doing that on YouTube right, for threatened. four years. Threatened. No, yes. no. It, to me, it was some find like, it overwhelming. Wow. It was yeah. kind of exciting to me. It was like a yes. new frontier that I could experiment with and learn about and just become like, I wanted to become a pro. I wanted to become so smart in this sector. Um, because why not? I mean, it was directly affecting me. So it was exciting. When I got the in-pen, I was like, this is so cool. And I just wanted to talk about it. And I did. I put it up on TikTok and it got like 600,000 views just showing off how to change the cartridge. 
And then, like, putting on a pump for the first time. I did a video with, like, you on camera and I, just me putting it oh, on yeah. with you in my ear. I hacked my insulin and, pump. <laughs> yeah, and, and people just found it so interesting. So, like, mm -hmm. I think people being able to find value in my content has just pushed me forward and wanting to find the coolest technology. For those who are watching on YouTube, you can see behind me I have, like, two screens, a sugar pixel and then a tidbit that are showing my blood sugar levels. Um... I mean, those are really neat devices to like learn about, but also share with other people. And I'm, I'm constantly on the search for and finding devices that I think people will value and, um, you know, possibly want to use around their homes yeah, and and I, with their treatment. And I think when you do that, Justin, you just do it and you make it fun and you apply it to how you use it in your life on social media. And it's just so great. And I think it takes away some of the threatening fears of using technology um, or feeling overwhelmed by technology. You sort of, you know, teach people how to apply using that technology to make their lives a little more fun and easier. Um, and it's so relatable. I really enjoy it. So um, I think that's been a great success for you. Um, and, you know, what about the dating and socializing with wearables on your um, you know, or teenagers I'm thinking of, or young kids that, you know, feel a little awkward, you really use your wearables and your diabetes supplies and things in such a cool way where you're proud of the, that. Like, how did you get from, how did you get there with all this? I think it's similar to like what I do on social media. It's that like, I know most of my friends and even family know nothing about this technology. And it's also can be, you know, right in their faces. Like I'm looking at my Apple Watch. Well, I don't want them to think I'm not paying attention to them. So I tell them, this is what I'm doing on my Apple Watch. I'm looking at my sugar levels. I'm giving myself a bolus. Or when I was on an insulin pen and like using that, I would do it at the, the table. I'm not going to go to the bathroom to like give myself insulin real quick. So I'd be like, oh, I'm going to give myself insulin. Like this is what I have to do to do that. And just kind of like show them what people have to go through and just so they can be more educated and understanding of that. And then the same thing happens like with loop. Like I like to show people it and anyone I've ever like dated, that's like one of the first few things I like to show them like, Oh, Hey, like check out this like system that I'm on. Like I hacked my insulin pump and these are the devices I work and I use. And I think part of that's also cause like I really want to share that side of me sooner rather than later with people to kind of weed out anyone that like wouldn't be comfortable with that. I haven't come into contact with anyone who's uncomfortable with that, but it's just something I like being open about. Cause like there is like a part of me underneath it all that is insecure about it and like yeah, dating people and then worrying about like, are they going to be okay if I have a low? Are they going to be okay if my pump mm -hmm. falls off? The Actually, the person I'm dating right now has been like so understanding. The other day we were out at a friend's house. We drove somewhere like 15 minutes away and my insulin wasn't working. Like it, there was something mm -hmm. wrong. Like my sh blood sugar was so high. Uh, he was ordering Domino's and I was like, hey, like, my blood sugar, like my pod's just not working. He's like, you know what we're going to do? We're going to go pick up the pizza and I'm going to drive you back to my place and we're going to change the pump and go get the pizza. Like it's fine. Yeah. And that was just like so supportive. So like, it's really about finding people that are going to be supportive to you in those moments. And that's like, I mean that like relieved, like I have no worries about my like diabetes with him, which was, is super important to me. That's wonderful. And I also think it's the way that you come across as being a person that copes with it really well. So when something goes wrong, you know, you're like, oh, I use this. I'm usually doing great. Here I work out and you know, I'm a healthy guy, but I have this thing. Right. And I'm not hiding it. Um, so then when something does go wrong, you know, your main persona is that you cope with this disease. You're not always low. Your insulin isn't always failing, you know? So I think that's part of the, you know, the discussion when you meet someone new is to present diabetes as, hey, this is a completely manageable condition. And most of the time I'm, at, I'm, I'm living a normal life, but every once in a while I have these, these issues, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. And, um, 
So, you know, you talk a lot about how social media has, you know, helped you cope and how being involved in a diabetes education program with an educator like me has helped. We haven't talked much about your family, but I like how you talk about how you speak to them about your diabetes. But, you know, how do you act, ask your family for help? That is a big, huge issue for most people with diabetes. They don't know how to ask for what they need from their families. How has your family been for you? It's interesting. I don't really ask my family for any help. And I think that's because they don't fully understand, even though I've kind of tried to educate them, I don't think I'm with them and often enough for them to fully understand like the struggles or like the, the, the difficult moments. I mean, there was one time I went on, like out on Long Island and I like forgot my insulin, which is crazy. Like, how do you forget your insulin? And I was like, okay, I have eight hours of my Omnipod left. Like, we need to go, we need to be home by this time. They were like, no, let's just like get another vial of insulin. But I was like, I don't want to pay $50 for a vial of insulin when I can pay $60 and get like a three month supply. It's like ridiculous that that's even a thing, but we wound up getting it a vial. So, but it was kind of cool for me in a sense for them to understand that that's something I have to go through. But besides that, I mean, I f feel like at least with my dad, like he's like, you shouldn't eat that right. Or like, you can't eat this. And he like doesn't get it, even though I've told him multiple, multiple times. I'm like, I can eat whatever mm -hmm. I want. Um, <laughs> even my, my mom's like pretty good. I think she she gets it at this point that like I can eat whatever I want. And my sisters get it. My little sister's a nurse. So her and I have like wow. a good her and I have really good conversations about it because she even like will sometimes take like a gel pack for me from like the hospital and be like, I got you this, you know, <laughs> like it's really, you know, like a glucose gel. Mm -hmm. um, and she'll, she'll ask me like, how are your sugars? Or like, oh, that's going to be tough. Like, it's nice to be able to bond with her over that. Um, but yeah, I, I think because I was diagnosed at 30 years old, very independent, I was on the other side of the country at the time I was in LA, they were in New York. Now I'm in New York. I couldn't really rely on them that much to like help me. I, yeah, I could call them on the phone and complain, but that's not productive. So I, I think at the time I was in Palm Springs living with my friend and that friend was very supportive to me. Oh, and then I had like right, the, the people right. on social Crucial. media. Yeah. And I had a few uh, type one friends also that I was able to reach out to as well, which I feel very fortunate for. Yeah, I think that's a real helpful thing, support groups. And you did come to my men's support group for a little while. What was that like for you to finally meet a bunch of guys that are really successful and, you know, live in their lives with diabetes? Yeah, I think it's not very often that I'm in a room or a virtual room surrounded by people like me. Yeah. And <laughs> it's cool to, like, just be with a group of people that just get it. Like, they understand this entire side of you that's a huge side of you like it is a second job that you're working all the time and it even though diabetes isn't who we are it really is a large part of our mental use just like managing this so being able to share um what's working for us in that group and in any group i think is so important um these groups, I, like I recommend, I think everyone should, who, who feels like that, even if you don't feel like you need it, I think everyone could find that it's helpful to be in groups that they could just like share, like, you know, these, this is what I'm doing. This is the tech I'm using. And what are you using? Like that's, and that's what I try to do on social media is share like all the different things that exist so that people can ask their doctors about it. But also like, you know, it, it's nice to be in a room where you can actually ask those questions in person to people, you know, or even virtually, which I'm sure a lot of virtual groups exist, too. I think it's that old thing like, you know, the younger brother sees the older brother riding a skateboard and in a couple months, you know, he's able to get on the skateboard because he saw his brother could do it. You know, like just being that role model of like, hey, I do this. I wear this. I ski. I go to Palm Springs. I go to Mexico. I am I party. You know, like uh, I'm a regular guy and I'm I have type one diabetes and I can do this. And so you can do this. You know, I think that's a really huge influence that you have on others. 
and I appreciate that. Um, you know, I was going to mention this uh, in, in chronic disease self-management recovery. There's this old saying that says, you know, for the old timers that have mastered their disease, you have to give it away to keep it. You know, so you have to, you know, in order to keep managing your disease, you have to help others, you know, and, um, you know, t share your experience, your strength and your hope with those people that are still struggling. You know, um, I feel like you've really embodied that philosophy. You know, um, how do you, how do you feel about, you know, being an influencer and educating people and, you know, how have you given to them and how do they give back to you to help you cope and stay in a mastery yeah, type mean, of position? It's the messages I receive that push me to continue doing what I'm doing and also help guide me to what content I should be creating for people. Just hearing that that photos or videos that I post make people feel more comfortable about showing their diabetes technology or sharing videos that explain different technologies and make people be able to use it better and, and better manage their diabetes with that technology, use a widget that they didn't even know existed. I think that in life, we all kind of look for a way to give back. And I had been searching for a long time, like how I could give back. You know, also, I think as you get older, that's something that's just like innately grows within you, right? Like we, we almost have this parental thing that grows within us, whether or not we have kids, we want to we, we've grown all this wisdom that it would be a waste just to not tell anyone about it, right? You can, you can help people before they make those mistakes, although mistakes are sometimes worth making. But I think that there are all, there's a lot of great things that we can offer the younger generations that helped us grow uh, so that they can grow stronger and, and, and have better coping mechanisms for doing that. So getting these messages from parents saying like, my seven year old loves watching these videos and it makes him smile. Or I had this other message from a lady that's like, my son always says like, I want to watch the diabetes videos. And she's like, he's talking about you. Like, it's just so incredible to, to hear that I'm making an impact on people's lives. And also, that I could do this as my job and I can sustain myself in a way that like I'm having fun, I'm creating cool content, working with cool brands and also just connecting with other people and teaching. Yeah. And I would also add to that, you know, you're sharing your vulnerability and your imperfections, you know, and no human being gets through this life without having problems. Right. And I think you're real. You know, people can identify with the difficulties that you share. You know, you don't go on social media and pretend that you're perfect. You just go on there and you show how you're coping with this disease. It is not an easy disease, you know. And I think, you know, one of the last questions I'd like to ask you is, what is the hardest part of having this disease? Hmm. I think the hardest part is even though I do feel like I'm living a very normal life and having just a fulfill, just as much a fulfilling life, I still don't feel like I can always fully be in the moment and free, free from my phone connected to my Dexcom and my loop free for drinking and then going dancing and running around untethered from anything um, going to a blackout dinner and just fully enjoying that meal and the taste and the smell which is what it's meant for that experience is meant for um i as much as i try to like promote that we are just as equal as other people there's still a part of me, and I'm sure everyone that has type 1 diabetes that realizes that 
and maybe this is harder for people who are diagnosed later in life because like I do know what life was like before and it's like sometimes I just like I don't go to eat chicken fingers and french fries because it's like it scares me or like I don't go to eat pop like I just don't go to the Italian restaurant or like you're getting pizza after this like I passed a pizza place on the way home today and my old self would go get pizza because I needed a quick snack but today I was just scared to eat pizza which is like a very real thing and I, I guess I haven't really thought about <laughs> until you asked me this question um but like my life has been changed in many ways and I and I do feel like I'm not able to like live as free a life as I used to. But with that said, I do think that so many positives have come out of this. It's set me in a direction that's like been so fulfilling and I'm proud and I wouldn't I really wouldn't take it away. I really wouldn't take it back. I, I, I feel so good right now about where things are and, and what I'm being able to offer and being part of this community and introduced to this community that's so strong and supportive. So like with all that said, like I don't, you know, I wouldn't take it back for anything. I mean, like I do want a cure. <laughs> I would love to see a cure or, and I also want to see more and more technology. And I also like, with the with the pace technology's been going, I do have a lot of hope. Not even hope. I know that technology is going to get better and better and better. In, in ten years, we may not even have to like bolus. It may just do it for you. Like, it, and I, I really, I mean, people used to go low all the time. Nowadays, with closed loop systems, people don't go low that often. I go low. I have a bad low maybe every three months. A bad low. Like a bad low, meaning like 50, you know, like, and it's also, I attribute that to, I never rage bolus. I never rage wow. bolus. I think that causes trouble, rage bolus. Do I program? You should I say program... anymore. You should say anymore because you, you yeah. have way back, right? Yeah, Remember? I'm sure I did back I in the day. I told you about rage bolus. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, I think I found mechanisms to be able to adjust my blood sugar levels to the best of my ability. But um, I think that's helped. But yeah, I think I miss I think the number one thing I miss is really just being untethered specifically from my phone, leaving it in a, a Airbnb room and going in the pool and not having to worry about Bluetooth signal through water right, and loop right. not connecting, <laughs> like all these things. And also just like, yeah, having those moments where I need to step away because I'm, I have to address a high or a low. Right. So. And I think that's why, you know, they say the final phase of grieving is acceptance, not wiping you clean and you have no diabetes. So, you know, you're in acceptance, but you still are in acceptance that you still have this disease, but it's you're going to cope with it. You're going to move on and you find the good in your life no matter what. And you just you, you deal with it one day at a time and you're a shining example. So thanks for all you do. You're an inspiration. Thank you. Yeah, I'd say like when it comes also just like with what I was saying, like when it comes to like normal days, like when I'm just kind of living my life, I do feel like I for the most part am able to do like I feel like very comfortable and like I, it's just any other day. I think it's those like going on a vacation, going to group dinners. That's the times that cause a little anxiety or a little um, maybe um, I'm just like a little envious of of those people I'm with that they're able to just like do whatever they want. But yeah, it's about finding those silver linings. I, I have accepted this for sure. And now it's just about thriving to the best of my ability. You know, do you ever have those days where you just go, why me? I give up, Blah, you know, despair, despair. Um, do you ever have those days or did you ever have those days? And like, what were some of the tools that you used to sort of push through that rough day that you may have had? Do you have a story I, or a... I think that oftentimes when I have a moment, I wouldn't say I have days, but I have moments throughout a day sometimes of like, why, you know, why this? And I think that also comes from the 
physical anxiety that comes from a low. Like I think that if I'm having mm -hmm. a bad low, it just, yeah. it is anxiety that comes from that, your body's shutting down. So in that moment, I'll just start thinking like, why me? Like, why is this something that I have to go through? This sucks so much. But I also have to tell myself, and it takes a little while sometimes, it's good, you're gonna get over this, you're gonna be fine. This is just a moment you're having and mm -hmm. uh, just just treat it. And in an hour or 30 minutes, you'll you'll feel fine. I think that I've just gotten better at like, if I am really high for a long period of time, I've gotten better at accepting that that's not who I am or it's not what always happens, it's just a moment. And yeah, I can get a little down on myself sometimes, but I try to repeat to myself, like, you're going to come down, you'll be fine. Right. Or also, it's like, is your pump, like, it's also coming out with the, 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 troubleshooting, the yeah. fixing, troubleshooting, right? Like, is my yes. pump okay? Is the insulin spoiled? Like, there's a lot of other things that, like, you just learn over time. You're like, okay, I, let me move my pump and let me use a different insulin. And then, okay, it's fine. There are just so many different factors that come into your life when you're managing type one diabetes. Um, and I think that is why people do have a very difficult time with this disease. And um, they need examples uh, of people that are suffering with some of the difficulties and also coping really well and moving on with their lives. So I think that whole, that the wholeness of your approach to telling your story day by day of having diabetes with other people is so successful. Is there anything else that you would add to this that you could tell other people that might be newly diagnosed? Um, any advice for them in coping and moving through that continual continuum of denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and then finally to acceptance and mastering of this disease? Um, what kind of advice would, might you give someone that's newly diagnosed like that? Yeah, I'd say like, First of all, it's okay to be overwhelmed at first because, or, or just, I mean, at any point, because there is a lot to learn when it comes to carb counting, when it comes to all bolus, basil, like what all these terms are. So it's okay to be scared. <laughs> and um, I think the best way to kind of push forward is find resources, whether it's diabetes education, uh, other people on social media, reaching out to friends or friends who have friends with type one. That's so important is being able to connect with other people and, and learn from them piece by piece. Yeah, and, you know, and I would also say, you know, some of the things I've seen you do is, you know, reach out to me and say, hey, I'm thinking about going on this trip and I'm scared, what should I do? You know, like yeah. um, your healthcare team, you know, am I ready for this? You know, um, just having those people that think, can yeah. sort of help you along the continuum. You need to be okay with asking for help. You can't do this alone. I think that that's like the number one thing that I've learned and I'm even continuing to learn in my own like journey with like long COVID that I'm going through is that I need to reach out to people who are experiencing that and tell, tell me about supplements they're using or how long they were experiencing their symptoms to help me get through my struggle. So I've been seeking out that community and that help because if you don't seek out the help and you're doing it by yourself, it's depressing, it's isolating, and you won't you won't get, it won't get better, no. right? If we so, could figure it out our problems by ourselves, we would do it, right? Uh, it, it I really believe in getting some help. Yeah, it does. Right. Speaking of that, I, one last question that, you know, I, I didn't want to forget to ask. Have you ever gone to therapy? Did Have you used a therapist? Um, I was am it in mostly... need of a therapist. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have, so I've never needed to go to therapy because of the diabetes alone, at least. I think that there are multiple factors in my life that, including diabetes on top of all of it, that compounded 
therapy would be very useful. I think at early diagnosis, you said something to me as my educator that like, I'm here to be your diabetes therapist, like, or I'm even just here to be your therapist, right? You were like, talk to me about whatever you want. So I think that yeah. like being able to use that resource to vent and yes. learn was so helpful. And then I think for therapy, I mean, I think therapy can be really helpful for tackling all of those things going on in your life outside of diabetes, which will make your diabetes easier to handle. I agree. I agree. And I think also, like you said before, you know, getting yourself a year with your diabetes educator once a month. I mean, there were times that we were meeting once a week um, to try to figure out your insulin ratios, you know, things like that. And just, you know, find somebody you can really talk to that knows about type 1 diabetes. I think that type 1 diabetes is such a rare disease in relation to type 2 diabetes that it is a subspecialty. And I think it's nice to find somebody that knows insulin pumps and devices and, and type 1. Yeah, and, and my, ins my, um, my insurance at the time covered in full diabetes education, my, my appointments were free. So, and there was no limit to the amount of appointments. So that's why I was like, yeah, let's meet every, every week. Like I can do whatever I want. So yeah. I highly recommend people looking at what their insurance offers. I have a feeling most insurances offer very inexpensive or free diabetes education because it's kind of necessary. So people should look into that and then just take advantage of it for as long as they need to. I absolutely agree. And every insurance company does uh, cover for diabetes education and is quite generous with type ones. So um, I would encourage, like you said, everyone to look into it and to use the, that benefit every year, you get a certain amount of hours. Um, and there are some commercial insurance companies that don't even cap you on hours. So and, and do a unlimited, like you said. So I think that's a great um, point that you make there. Thank you for coming on the show to interview me about this. I hope that, you know, listeners have learned something new or just feel like they're not alone in their early diagnosis or even their like continuing journey that like, yeah, I am on social media showing off all this cool stuff with a smile, but like, it's not perfect. And I try to show that too. So you're not alone. <laughs> Yeah, and I, and I think I always try to tell people that it's never going to be perfect with diabetes. We don't expect, expect you to be have your time in range at 100%. You know, it's just above 70%. So it's not ever going to be perfect. Put your perfectionism away. Yeah. You know, just it's not going to be a perfect life, but it can be a normal, great life with a normal, great, amazing life expectancy these days and these automated pumps and little tech tools we have can just make your life so much easier. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Justin. Thanks for listening to today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Mary Rose, you are awesome. Thank you so much. I'm excited to have you back on the show to talk more diabetes. New episodes of this podcast release every Monday on YouTube and all podcast platforms, so be sure to follow there. I've also got new videos coming out on YouTube every Friday that are separate from the podcast. If you want to follow me there or on social media, I've got links to everything in today's show notes. Until next week, I'm Justin, and I'll talk to you later.